Good morning, and yes, construction is still happening. Would you stand and worship with us?
It's not hard to see, oh, only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. Good morning, church. I snuck up on your bad side. Good morning, everyone. So, starting to look a little different in here, right? Kind of missing something down here that used to be there. That's going to be a bad habit to have to break. But we are so excited about what's happening here at the church and what all we're uh, God is blessing us to be able to do. Here's the very first thing I need to tell you before I even tell you who I am. We have people that are still coming in and they're trying to find seats. So if you have an empty seat next to you, will you slide over and give that empty seat up? We're trying to get like families that won't have to split up and do a seat here and a seat there. We're trying to get two or three, four seats together. So if you've got empty seats by you, Please just scooch over and try to free up as many of those as you can. That would be fantastic, and we thank you for that. 
um, horrible problem to have that we have to squid, squish in and, and love on each other here at church, right? <laughs> Good morning. My name is Anita Wellborn. I am the Director of Ministry Development here at Carolina's Cornerstone. And it is exciting to be here in the midst of things changing, in the midst of things happening, in the midst of fall. And did you know that I saw on my phone this morning, there's only 50 days until Christmas? <laughs> Oh, we got one really excited person, 50 days till Christmas. Here's what I can tell you. She is not a mama. Because <laughs> us mamas aren't ready yet. Us dads aren't ready yet. But it's going to be here whether you're ready or not. There's a couple of things I want to bring to your attention inside your worship folder this morning. Because we want you to be a part of everything we're doing here at Carolina's Cornerstone. And so this worship folder gives you all kind of information on things that are happening. For you guys that are tuning in on Facebook Live, we're so thrilled you're with us this morning. There are ads that will be rolling and have been rolling all morning. We want you to be in the know as well. But a couple of things I want to bring your attention to because it's going to be a busy, busy season and we want you to be involved with everything that's happening. For parents of kids, young kids that are in our preschool, our uh, elementary classrooms, we are having a Thanksgiving movie night. The kids are going to get to come here. We're going to be showing them the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving and a little extra bonus something from Charlie Brown. But it gives you as parents a couple of hours to go get dinner together with no kids, maybe to do a little Christmas shopping with no kids, just to go home and kick your feet up for a couple hours with no kids. We're going to babysit your kids here. We're going to have a good time and do a project with them. And, and Joe's going to be um, showing them the movie, but we need to get them signed up. And so there should be, wait, no, I might be telling you incorrectly. Oh, this is our new service. This is a text service. This is super easy to register. You just text. Follow the instructions right here. Text movie to 833-215-4009 on the screens inside your worship folder. Text that number and it gets you registered just like that. Super easy thing, brand new that we're trying. We're trying to give you all the ways, updated ways to get involved in things here at the church. Underneath that same ad in the worship folder is one for a uh, night of Thanksgiving that we do here every year. It's done on the Sunday evening before Thanksgiving, and we want to invite you all to come and be a part of this. It'll be a night of worship, uh, a night of testimonies, people standing up and sharing what God has done in their life this year and how grateful they are for what God is doing in their life, in their church, and in their community. And so you want to come and hear some of these um, beautiful testimonies. We'll have a time of praise and worship. We're also going to be doing communion that night together as we just really thank the Lord for all that he is doing in this church and in our lives. And so we want you to be a part of that. Go ahead and mark your calendars. November 19th, 6 o'clock right here in the worship center. We want you to come and be a part of that. And then I want to tell you about our mission opportunity for this month. We know it's a really busy time of year and we've been doing missions and missions and missions. But here's, that's the call of the church. That is the call of the church, is to spread the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. And we are trying to do that. And this year, we are going to partner with Tender Hearts Ministries. We've done this before. And we're doing a toy drive. If you saw when you came in, there's already a Christmas tree up. Let me tell you why. On, those Chris, on that Christmas tree are these hearts. It has different um, age groups of boys and girls that are part of families that are hurting this holiday season. Maybe they are homeless. Maybe they um, have just moved into an apartment and parents have just gotten a job. But we want to help them provide Christmas for their kids. And so we want you to help us help them. Does that make sense? You're going to go out after the service today. You're going to pick up one of these hearts. Doesn't matter what the age is. Doesn't matter if it's a girl or a boy because these are all kids that are going to be right here in York County in our neighborhood that's going to get Christmas this year because we're going to help them get Christmas. And so we want you to pick that heart up. Now here's what I'll tell you. They've only sent 100 hearts right now. They don't know us very well. We're, we could get rid of 100 hearts today, I guarantee it. We're just going to have you pick up a heart. And if something happens that you get out there and the tree doesn't have any more hearts on it. All right. So here, here's, did you hear what she said? They were trying. <laughs> you stay after church today, okay? I want, I want us to get all of these. Listen, it's better to give than receive. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that right now. 
Come on, tell them. You're welcome. Before I was so blessed, blessed to be interrupted by the pastor, what I was saying was if you go out and there are no hearts on that tree, please don't think that's a reason not to participate. You don't have to have a heart. Let me rephrase. I, that, I heard that coming out differently. You don't have to have a paper heart from the tree to have a heart big enough to go out and buy a gift for a child. It doesn't matter what gift you buy. Some child is going to be blessed by that. And so if you go out and there's no hearts on the tree, still go out and get what you can get and help us. You're going to bring those toys back all month long and drop them in the box right out there in the foyer. Um, I know the Maddens have been doing stuff all year long out here. Her little, little bunny told me that y'all have been doing stuff all year long to help these kids. And I'm so excited to see what's going to happen at the end of this month. Your generosity is really going to help families this Christmas season. And let me tell you one thing. Don't wrap them. And this is why I'm asking you not to wrap them. Because they actually set up a store for the moms and the dads with all of the gifts that we will bring. And they let them go shopping for their kids to pick out what they know their kids want. So we don't need them wrapped. We just need new toys in that box by the end of the month to help out families right here in York County. Sound good? All right. So we got lots and lots happening here. Again, check out the back of your worship folder, things that are coming up very soon. Our prayer um, service is coming up quickly too. Um, and so we want you to be in the know. If you're new or visiting with us, this same worship folder is the key for you to let us know that you were here today. This little extended portion has a QR code right at the bottom of that. You just scan that with your phone. It'll send you to a short form that you can fill out to let us know that you're here visiting with us today. We want to be praying alongside of you as maybe you're looking for a new church home. For those of you that are here in the worship center, or if you don't do these QR code thingies, you just come out to the welcome center table after the service today. We have a small little card that you can fill out to let us know the exact same information. And like I said, the pastor and the staff here just want to welcome you and we want to make sure that we know that you were here today to worship with us. Okay? Pastor? He's here. It's my turn. Well, I, I, I just want us to say to first, I, I want to say to the 25 people that have come and worked for the last two weeks just to get this remodeling done to where it is. And you look around this morning, and you, all the lights have been changed, and you can look at your Bible and still be kind of in the dark. And what I wanted to do this morning, I want to say thank you for the 25 people, and they are a team here at Carolina Cor Cornerstone. There's no I. It's a team process. Everything we do is a team, and it's all to point people to Jesus Christ and make sure that God loves us and takes care of us. And so I want us this morning to, to give thanks for the folks who have come and helped so far, and we have much more to do. Let's give the Lord a praise clap for those folks. <clears throat> so there's, there's so much to do, and, and if you're here for the first time, this church has been here for a while, and this is the first time anything's been done here in the, the auditorium, upfitting it and doing this. And this tape is here is not for you, it's for me, so I don't step off. Because that first step's a doozy. And so I want you to know that and just want you to be aware of that. We're so honored that you're here today. If you're here for the first time, can I just say to you personally, thank you for coming. Uh, you'll have a great time. Today's sermon is going to be phenomenal. And I want to encourage you not to leave at the end of the service. There's, the Lord's given me something I want to do. And I want to challenge you today before you leave. And I want you to stay with me today. So today we have folks to pray for. We have many to pray for. I want you to be praying about the situation that's in Ukraine. I want you to be praying about the situation that's in Israel. Uh, the situation in Israel is just getting bigger and bigger every moment, it seems. And I want you to be praying for uh, Connie Cola's mother, uh, Ursula Wallace. She had a, they think she had a light, a stroke yesterday, and she's down in Columbia. So I want you to be praying for Connie as they're going back and forth and just praying that, that her mom will just get better and, and get back on. I want you to be praying for George Franklin. George has the MRI tomorrow, and we're trying to find the area for the pain. And so this is going to be crucial. I want you to be praying for uh, Jesse Samples is having a, a, some more procedures done on his heart. And it's a process that they're using. And we're going to get him better, and he'll, be going, he'll get feeling better. 
But, but he's here every time the door's open, I want you to know. Then I want you to be praying for Benny Rubin. Benny is back here, and Be Benny Rubin is back here, and he is going through some treatments with radiation. We've been praying. He, is, uh, he has no cancer on the surface, but they're just doing a couple little spots of radiation. And I told him to radiate on. Let's get going back out here this morning. I want you to be praying for him. But I also want you to be praying for Annette. Annette's going, uh, is king through some real battles with her hip. I want you to be praying. We have John's back with us this morning. John Russell's right over here. And we're, we're so honored by that to be here. And then I, I want to say something to many of you this morning. I, I want to say it's good. We have the Webbs back. They're back. They've been up in Virginia for the summer trying to help those mountain people in Virginia. And the only problem is the coach used to coach football up there. Coach, you need to go back and help them on the college team up there, okay? So I'm putting you on that. But this morning, the question I want to ask you is what is guiding you? What is guiding you through life today? I want you to think about that for a few moments. I want to invite you to come pray with us this morning. And the way we do it here is that we invite folks to come down in front here. Um, we, we just kneel wherever we can kneel. Some folks can't kneel. Some folks will have to stand. But we want you to come and pray with us this morning. There's so much to pray. God is blessing our church. He is blessing our church. People are coming to know Christ in this whole process. And I want you to know him. I want to invite you one more thing. I want to invite you tonight. It's 430. We have, we're doing the chosen and we're walking through the chosen. And listen, episode seven is where we are. You can go home this afternoon while you're eating lunch and watch episode seven. Be back at 430. We'll discuss it. To me, it's the most powerful piece of the whole season one is tonight. So I want you to watch it with me. So would you do me a favor this morning? You that will, will you come and just pray with us? You come and kneel. Come and stand and just pray with us. Give all your cares to the Lord this morning. Come on, let's pray. So God, would you open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears to hear what you're trying to do. You have blessed this church so much this week. We've seen people, Lord, who've gone through very tough times. They got a break. The bondage was released. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us today. Lord, we do pray that you would be with George tomorrow, that, that they would find the problem and Lord, touch his life and, and begin to help him get out of the pain. We pray for Jesse on the 10th as he goes and does what he's supposed to do and that his heart and the process will just get better. And Lord, I pray this morning for Annette that, Lord, you would just touch her life, heal her problems in this leg and hip. I pray for healing. 
I pray for Benny, Lord, for John coming back this morning. We pray for the miracle. Lord, we need to pray for each other because you're on the throne and you're in the healing business. You're in the saving business. You're in the business of delivering us out of bondage. So God, help us today. Thank you for your son, Jesus, dying on the cross at Calvary. And all God's people said, amen. Let's give the Lord a praise clap. running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running out, it's running after me. Your goodness is running out, it's running after me. With my life laid down.
This is where everybody says what? Amen. That's right. God is good this morning. He's working mightily. And I just want to say thank you for being here this morning. And, and today, I want to ask you not to leave. A lot of you, and I know you're trying to beat the, the Presbyterians to the restaurant. And today, I don't want you to leave. I want you to stay to the very end today. Because the ending is a key. The ending is what will allow you to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Do you know how many people it takes for the preacher to get help to preach? It takes about nine or ten. All right, this is perfect. Right there. Right, you're doing good. Right there. Let's give these guys a big hand. The preacher's always throwing curveballs. So this morning, we're in the, the next to the last series in this whole sermon series called You Asked For It. And these are questions that have been brought to me over the years, and I've been wanting to do this for years to preach this, but today I, I get a chance to preach on a, a one little piece that I want to do this morning. This morning, I'm trying to share with you how, fi how do you find your way in life. Some of you have grown up and, you're, and you've been taught correctly. Some of you have, didn't have any guidance at all, and I understand I I understand that I'm trying to move forward just like everybody else. And even though sometimes I know to do right, I do wrong. Is there anybody in here with me this morning? You know to do right, but you do wrong. Would you raise your hand? Hold on, raise your hands up. Look at your neighbor and tell him to get the hand up, okay? So, so what happens is that we're in this, in this thing is that we, we know that in life there's a series of choices, and we make choices, and we don't realize it, but we make choices every move we make in life. We make decisions, and sometimes those decisions are good, and sometimes they're bad. Every decision that you make has consequences, and we are imperfect people. That means that no one in this room is perfect. So I want you to turn to your neighbor in a loving way and say, you ain't perfect. Now you turn, now you turn to your neighbor and say, I love you. <laughs> so, so the whole thing is we got to make choices, and, and we make difficult choices. Sometimes we have to decide to move. Sometimes it's about a new job. Sometimes it's about getting married. It's about what school put our kids in. And, and, and these uncertainties that we have in life, cause great stress if you don't believe it a few folks that are football players who love football games like georgia yesterday they were stressed out at the end clemson was stressed south Carolina was we're all was stressed out because we want our favorite team to win and we want to know what's going to happen in life we want to know all the details before we ever start and we live in a world that doesn't give you those kind of details and so we, we don't know what to do. But the Bible says in the book of James, James uses a term called the double-minded person. Or in King James, it says that a double-minded man is a person who's unstable. The way you really translate that in, in, over in the Greek, it says he's a drunk. He's drunk. We, when we get so intoxicated, we don't know what we're saying or do. And in this, we need to know how to go through life and find our way. I don't know about you, but I'm a person who does not have a lot 
of gifts and directions. I'm not gifted in that area. Uh, I, I'm, I'm challenged in that area, trying to, if I come to a stop sign and I don't know which way to go, if, if my idea is to go right, I go left because it works better that way. And I, and, and I have a GPS, and her name is Linda, and I tell her all the time, take me here, take me there. And she says, I, I don't understand what you're saying. And then this little note comes that you're a redneck call. So what happens to us is that we got to do it. We need to find an antidote for these stressful moments in our life. And the Bible is the, is the answer to your question. The answer is the Bible. The Bible it is God's word. It is without error. And it's made to help us and teach us. It is a compass in life of what to do. It's a personal guide best you can see. God wants to lead us on the right paths. Not bad paths, but right paths. And, and, and I think what the problem of it is, is that we don't understand, is we don't invest. This is why our church is so much involved in Sunday school, or what you want to call it, life groups, cell groups, whatever, small groups. We want to come together and learn. That's why we will do it tonight. We'll come together and learn what the story is. I, I just have to give you this. In the story, it's, it's Jesus and Nicodemus meeting. It's scriptural. Jesus meets Nicodemus. We don't know all that went on with the conversation, but I'll tell you this. I think my friends at Chosen have got this part of it right because it's so powerful. The first time I watched it years, a year or two ago, I just broke down in tears. I watched it this week numerous times, and I've been weeping every time I watch it. We need to understand that we need to help. The Lord needs to help us to figure out life, what we need to do. You remember in the book of Psalms 23, you've heard of many, many times, it's used, overused in the by overused in sermons, and it's overused especially in funerals. And it says, "The Lord is my shepherd; I have everything I need. He lets me rest in the green pastures. He leads me to the calm waters. He gives me strength. He leads me on the paths that are right for the good of His name." And He tells us this morning that He is the good shepherd. He leads us, he directs us, he guides us. But the question of it is, if you're not in the word, you won't know what direction you need to go. God is a good God. He loves you this morning. In fact, listen to me. If you've ever felt guided by God, that's a great thing. If you felt God leading you and guiding you and helping you, that is phenomenal. Because what happens, it means that you're reading and you're listening to what he is saying to you. In Romans 8, 14, it says, only those who are led by God are God's children. Life composed, life ourselves are composed of starts and stops. I mean, you ever felt like you're going down this direction and all of a sudden you stop? Maybe you felt like the Lord was leading you to stop or maybe you thought he was leading you to stop and you stopped and he didn't say anything about stopping. He didn't say a word about stopping. You just thought he did. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to help you through God's word, which is the way it ought to be done anyway, help you in life to figure some things out. The Bible is that life journey, and God has given you a roadmap, and it's called his word. So I want to do something this morning. I want to teach you what I've learned in, in going through school and seminary and all those wonderful things. I want to start in the negative. If you ever read Paul's epistles, you'll notice that Paul always, always starts with the negative. He does a little nice little introduction. How y'all doing? Good to see you. What's up? And then he gets into the negative, what's going on. And then he gives you the positive, And then he gives you life application. That's how I say, oh, I know how to preach. And what happens this morning is I want to help you this morning in this journey is I want you to, there's five things that I'm giving you from my personal experience. There are five things you need to stop doing. Hold your left hand up with five, okay? There's five things, that, and I'm going to teach you this morning. If you'll stop doing these five things, you'll, be, you'll get along better in life, and you'll know exactly what God. Number one is your culture. Romans 12, 2 from the NLT says, Do not copy the behavior or values of this world. Instead, let God transform you into a new person, by changing the way you think, then you'll know what God wants you to do. Your culture that you live in is not the culture you need to follow this morning. I don't care what they tell you on TV. I sure don't care to tell you what politicians are saying in Washington. 
But the culture that you live in, you got to be led by the Holy Spirit. There, it, you cannot be in two directions at the same time. You cannot. I'm, I'm go back, grew up in hunting, growing up. You can't chase two rabbits at one time. You can't serve God and money at the same time. You, you can't follow the crowd as Exodus 23, 2 says, do not follow the crowd and do it wrong. The crowd will lead, your culture will lead you the wrong path. This culture that we live in today is about me, 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 me. That's what our young people are being taught about. Is this all about me? Can I just give you a piece of scripture? It ain't about you. It's from my redneck version, but it's, it ain't about you. It's about God. It's about other people. God tells us, if you want to serve me, serve other people. When we get to this, we know that there's a lot of pressure being put on people in the culture. Listen, just go and watch the news this afternoon for a few minutes. Our country, again, has got another divide in it. Another divide. People for Israel, people against Palestine. So let me make this clear to you. I don't care what position you hold in the thing. I'll tell you this. This book is pretty powerful. It says those that come against Israel will be cursed. I'm just telling you how it is. And you may disagree with me. And if you want a history lesson, you come sit in my office for an hour. And I'll give you a history lesson on this land that we're hearing all the arguments about. You know what the number one piece of property is fighting for? It's for Jerusalem. Let me tell you what the end of this book says. Jesus sets on it. Jesus takes it. Let's give the Lord a praise for it. Okay, I got that off my chest. Now I feel better, don't you? Turn to your neighbor and say you love them. Go ahead. Okay. See, culture teaches us that we got to do certain things. Israel, the country of Israel, has gone through this for thousands of years. They wanted a king, and God said, you don't need a king. I'm your king. And they kept whining, 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 whining. And finally, finally, God said, okay, you want a king? I'll give you one. If you'll study history in the Bible, there's 40, like 43 of them, and ain't none of them no good. They just kept getting worse. You had God, what else do you need? God was the center of the whole thing. What we need to understand is that you live in a life where often you know right from wrong. Let's, let me give you an example. If you come out of here and you turn left today and you go down Gardendale and you're running past 35, you will get a ticket. You say, well, they put stop signs down there to slow it down. Y'all ain't slowing down. Let me tell you what your crazy preacher did last this week. It was late. I was tired. I only have one eye anyway, so I'm driving down the road. My mind's full of stuff. I almost ran. I ran right through the stop sign. Right in the middle of the intersection, I slam on brakes. I repent, and then I'm praying, God, please don't let nobody be down here watching me. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to tell you is that it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a preacher or whatever in life, you're still going to make mistakes. And the culture says, stop at the stop signs. I'm just trying to tell you, many believers today don't want to follow the standards of what's going on. They want to do whatever they want to do. The Bible tells us, don't value the culture that you live in. See, our culture is weak because it's so many people believe that this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing, this is the right thing, this is the wrong thing. Can I encourage you this morning to listen to me for a second? is that you need to understand we need to be on the right side of everything. History is often wrong. The Israeli people, and we study scripture, they were wrong when they disobeyed God, and we're wrong when we disobey God. So listen to me. History is often wrong. If you don't believe me, study, study Adolf Hitler and Nazism. Study communism. Study socialism. I'm just giving you two or three things. Out. Often these things are wrong because you know what they do? They push God out of the program. They don't even want God in. Let me tell you, as long as God's on the throne, he will be forever and ever. He will convict people of that. I cannot follow a culture that does not follow God. I'm trying to follow God. I'm trying to be led by his spirit. 
that's the mentality that you need to have. So when the world comes and it says you ought to do this, you need to make sure that's what you ought to do. Never, as Exodus 23, 2 says, never follow the crowd in doing wrong. The second thing I've learned, I need you to stop and you need, <laughs> is quit listening to your friends all the time. Don't let anyone lead you wrong. Christ is righteous, so be like Christ. You must do what is right. And anyone who keeps you on sinning is being led by the devil. So we got some folks together, and, and we, they want to do things together. And they know, some of them know it's not right by Scripture, but we want to get along with our friends. We don't want to lose our friends. We want to be happy, and we want, and you know what you're doing is wrong, but you do it anyway. That's called sin. And, and what he tells us is, is that we have friends who are always wanting us, for example, about missing church. Well, you can miss one Sunday. Can you? I'm just asking, can you? No. No. You never need to miss church. You know why I'm telling you this this morning? We live in a culture today. Listen to this. We live in a world today. When I was growing up, we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I reckon it was because my parents went because their son, Barry, was so sinful. He was always getting into trouble. But today we live in a world where people, do you realize since COVID, since COVID, only 31% of the people that were going to church before COVID are coming to church. 69% of Christians are not going to church today. Are you beating us up? No, I'm not. I'm telling you that we're moving too far to the left because we don't know what God's word says and we're not doing what God is telling us to do. This is the problem. I love you guys. I want you to do it. One of the reasons you don't hear God's will is because you don't hear what he's saying because you're not in his word. I'm just trying to get you to understand it's great to have friends, but don't let them make choices for you. Don't follow them because all they seem to be popular or they're doing things. Let me just throw this in here. I would love to watch Yellowstone. I'm a cowboy at heart. I even got cowboy boots at home. But I can't watch it because there's so much profanity in it. Now, I'm not picking on you who are watching it. Y'all just tell me what's, what, what's going on and leave all the other stuff out of it. I'm just telling you for me personally, I don't like to watch stuff like that. See, today we live in a world where all the commercials are about fun, life, and everything they advertise. Most of it I, I can't go along with. And what it does, it fills your mind with garbage. We're so worried about air pollution and water pollution. What about mind pollution? And what the Lord teaches us is that we need to teach our children. We need to make sure we're an example to our youth and to our students and to our children and to each other. We often have to remind ourselves that some young people are not good for our young people. That doesn't mean we don't love them. That doesn't mean we don't try to encourage them. That doesn't mean we don't drag them to church. So if all my students drag with their friends that are mean, we can win them to Jesus and double our youth group. That's all you got to do. What happens is that we want to get along because we don't want to hurt nobody. So let me just tell you this, you, you students this morning. I know you, you don't want me to pick on you, but I'm going to pick on you. If your mama tells you to be home at 12 o'clock, what time do you get home? Thank you very much, 11.59. You do what your mama tells you to do. Because your friends say, oh, they'll be asleep. Not at my house, we were not. When Megan and Katie was out, whatever, and they were doing life, they knew they'd be home at 12 o'clock. There's one person I guarantee was going to be awake, and that was their daddy. He never sleeps nor slumbers. <laughs> but with today, we have so much that are affecting us. I... I I want to quote something to you. I, I don't know who wrote it, but I'll put this up here. You cannot soar with eagles if you're running with turkeys. Somebody's mama told you that. Somebody's mama told you that. So my point of it is, is that our friends have great intentions. But when you're a follower of Christ, you cannot follow what the world does, even your best friends. And I'll tell you why. In Jeremiah 15, 19, the Bible says, you are to be a spokesman for Jesus. See, for you and I, we, we work in a, maybe in an office where people stand around and, 
I mean, they're around the water fountain or something, and they tell jokes, and those jokes are not always appropriate. You need to walk off from that stuff. You need to be. You, you need to keep your mind clear and focused on what you're trying to do. John 1, 2, 15 says, Do not love the world or anything that belongs to the world. If you love the world, you can't love the Father. This is what I'm trying to get you to see this morning, is that we're doing things in reverse. We're trying to be in both sides. We're trying to live in the world side and the Christian side. We can't do it. Number three, let me get you to stop this one. Substituting things for God. Now, I'm getting ready to get on your toes, so get mad at me now. You know, doesn't it? Some of y'all pick up the newspaper or pull up the paper every week, and the first thing you look at is you look at your horoscope. Mine's never right. I've read them before. And we go to psychics, and we try to get all these people to help us, and we substitute. The best place you need to look at, if you want to know what you need to be focused on, is the owner's manual, and it is called the Bible. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If your mind is anywhere else, these things that are replacing, these substitutes that are replacing God are idols. And God will not stand for it. He didn't stand for it back in the Old Testament. He won't stand for it today in our world. God will not be substituted by other things. So, well, I have a friend of mine who's moving and he's moving on Sunday. Fine, come to church first and then go help him move. I'm just saying to you, we're making too many excuses about not being in church. Listen, there's nobody loves sports as much as I do. I just don't get hung up in it like I used to. Yesterday, Clemson was winning. I had to keep turning the radio off and kept turning it off. Because if I wasn't listening to it, they seemed to do better. Now, you know that's not true. You, you, you know that's not true because they can't hear me. Everybody else can hear me hollering and screaming, but they can't hear me. Dabo Swinney's not listening to me to help him coach. He said, you ever play football? No, they wouldn't let me because I only had one eye. Well, what would you know about football? I know this. You can't run right and left every time and not get tackled. I know that part. Let me tell you ancient days of how people substituted for the movement of God. One is this. This is a little, just stick with me. You're going to think it's nuts, but it's true. What they would do, they would sacrifice an animal and take the liver of the animal out and they would hold it and they would try to figure out, hmm, I think we should go to war. That's a fact. Let me give you a thing about some friends that live in Russia. They would take, in, in Russia, there was a group of people that would take, and could take a, a, a handful of beans and throw the beans out on the floor and, and look for a design and that would tell them what to do. My friends horoscopes and all this other stuff is not going to get you in life. It's not going to help you. Read the book. Follow what the book says. If you're following the stars, listen to me. If you're following the stars, you're not following the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. You got to follow him. And see, so you got to remember what 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says. The Satan that we, our enemy, the adversary, the one who hates us, he masquerades as an angel of light. This is important. And then in 1 John 4, 1, it says, don't believe everything you hear. Just because it's on the news, just because it's on the internet, just because someone tells you, it's not always true. This is why you need to listen to the word of the Lord. Number four of these five, the circumstances. We always, we get hung up and we start thinking about Acts 27.10 says, man, I see that there's a lot of trouble on this trip, and the ship and the cargoes and even the lives may be lost. In this story, Paul is writing, and he has warned them not to go on this trip. He's a prisoner, and they're taking him out there, and he's warning them not to go on this trip. But they went anywhere. If you read Scripture, you'll just say they were in the water for two or three days because the trip was bad. I don't know about you, but I've had people come to me. And they say, we, we decided not to go on this trip because we, we had prayed and the Lord told us not to go. And they didn't go and bad things happened. That is of the Lord. But don't go by a quiver of your liver. 
Just because your liver quivers doesn't mean that's God speaking to you. And the point I'm trying to make here is, is that we're always doing things what we want to do. We really do. You remember the story about Jonah? He's the dude that got caught by the big fish. And, and in the big fish, he, the Lord tells him he wants to go down to Nineveh, which is these backward people. And he says, um, he didn't say anything. The Lord tells him. And he's, the Lord thought he was going this way, and he goes the opposite direction. And the Lord says, mm -mm. And so Jonah's trying to run from the Lord. So let me do a survey. How many of you have ever run from the Lord? I was going to ask, and just put your hands. I was going to ask how many of you are running right now, but I'll let you deal with that in a minute. So what happens, we learned in this story that Jonah couldn't get away from God, and you can't either. Finally, God puts him in the belly of the well for three days, three nights, no ESPN, no flashlight, no hot dogs, no nothing. And God got his attention. This morning, God's trying to get your attention this morning. Listen to me. I'm the biggest sinner in this room. I'm not perfect. I do not do everything right. I don't say everything right. But the Word of God does. And the Word of God says, listen to the Lord and do what he says. So you get, you got to be careful because if you put too much trust in circumstances, you'll be misled. I see it all the time. If Satan masquerades around as light and the circumstances come, you need to understand something. Your circumstances may be out of your control, but God is never out of control. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, you've heard it. I want to read it from the message translation. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. You cannot trust circumstances. Number five, you're going to love this one. This is a good one here. Number five, I want you to stop, is feelings. You know that song? How many of you know the song, If You're Old Like Me? You know where I'm going. Feelings. You old people who are with me, y'all ought to be singing this with me. Feelings. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but, but, but you, you get feelings. The other day I was in the store and they had these dogs in there and they were little dogs. They were like chihuahuas. I used to have a chihuahua named Peppy. She hung out with me for about 16 years. And, and, and when I, I just see them and I, I start talking to them because I know how chihuahuas are. Chihuahuas are a one-person dog. That's Megan. Megan would be in my chair at home and my dog Peppy was right beside me. And Megan could walk up and talk to me, but the moment that Megan reached for me, Peppy let her know who's in charge. You, you see, so I'm, I, I wait. I'm smart enough to know. So I, I kind of bend down and I pet them. They loving me and all that. I understand. I'm lovable. And so the whole idea was is that you can't go on feelings. Emotions are temporary. I want to say something to you this morning. I prayed about this comment that I'm going to make. Maybe this morning you're depressed. It will not last forever. You give it to the Lord. Let us pray with you and encourage you and help you, if necessary, help you find medical help. We'll do that because we love you and want to be there. Maybe you're battling panic attacks. They don't last forever. And we've got to keep pushing forward. And we've got to keep pushing forward. Let me tell you why. I've learned in my personal life, if I want to be led by God's Spirit, I cannot be led by my feelings because my feelings lie to me all the time. My feelings will lie to me. Do you realize you lie to yourself more than anyone else lies to you? You lie to yourself. Just because you think it doesn't make it true. Isaiah says, if we all are strayed like sheep and we're on a wrong path sometimes. Truth is simple truth. It's either right or it's wrong. If it was right 2,000 years ago, it's right today. I'm just saying. We all need to understand that peace is a good thing. But you better have more than just peace in your life, having a peaceful feeling than what you got. So I, I say this to you this morning, is that the Lord loves you, and he wants to give you a peace that passes all the understanding. So let me get to the good stuff now. I'll give you the five things that I want you to quit doing and listening to. Now I want to give you five things that I want you to listen to. Five things, five things, and here they are. 
First one, if you want to be, if, if you're getting and you want guidance this morning in your life to get you through life, I want you to get the guidance from God. Number one, let, let God lead you. Let God lead you. You got to have a desire first. You, you got to have a desire to be led. Most people don't like to be, let's just do a sermon. I'd be prepared. How many of you in here like to be told what to do? Raise your hand. Okay, Randy's over here because Shay's sitting beside him. What, what happens is that nobody likes to be told what to do. It, nobody. Turn to your neighbor. Don't tell me what to do. Go ahead, tell me. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Men will never say that to their wives so they go outside to the barn. I wish she would quit telling me what to do. Just tell her. No, no, no. Psalms 40 says this. May God, I want to do what you want. This is what Psalms 40 verse 8 says. God, I want to do what you want to do. That's, the, that's being led by that. You got to be willing. Number two, you got to be willing to be led. You got to be willing to allow the Holy Spirit guide you. If you're willing, before you even, listen, if you allow, be willing to do what the Lord has called you to do, when the Lord calls you to do something, you'll you answer, you'll interrupt him. You don't need to know all the details. You'll interrupt and say, yes, Lord, I'm ready. But you had not heard it all. I don't care. I'm ready. Yes. This is what the Lord is telling us about being willing to follow him and to be willing to be said yes. And this is what keeps people from being able to rise up, not to be leaders of all the stuff, but to be the kind of person that God has called you to be. If God called you today in full-time ministry, what would be your answer? Most would be no. Because you'd have to decide what's more important. God, we need to say this. We need to say, God, I want to surrender my life to you today. I want to do what you've called me, not what I want. It ain't about you. God, before you even tell me, I, I, my answer is already yes. you got to be willing. L l let me tell you about a story about one of our students in, in our church. Uh, um, he ha he's being led by the Lord. He has a desire. He's willing to do the right thing. He's even willing. So it was a student in our group. I won't mention his name, but his name is Carson. So he's playing... He's playing football, and if you know Car Carson's a little fellow, and, and he's playing football, and he's tough as a nail. He ain't scared of nothing. And, and Carson, his, their team went undefeated. Let's give Carson's team a big hand. His team went undefeated, okay? And, and Carson will tell you, I'm not telling you anything to Carson. Carson didn't get to play as much as he wanted to play, but finally one night they're playing in a game, and they're winning, and the coach says, okay, Carson, let's go. And Carson's out there, and, man, he's hustling. He's doing, almost gets an interception. And, and all those kind of things. And then all of a sudden, Carson comes to the sideline. Coach said, what's wrong? Hear me. This is your student in this church. He said, Coach, uh, would you put that fellow over there in my place? He, he ain't got to play. You know what the coach did? The coach listened and put the boy in. A little bit. That's right. Give him a hand. That's right. And then the coach finally said, go back in, Carson. Here's the point I'm trying to make. If you are led by the Holy Spirit, you will do crazy things for the Lord. You will do crazy things by the world's standard, but they're awesome and great things by God's standard. You see, for you and I, we need to remember, if we're going to be guided, we need to look. And what we need to look at is God's word. The Bible says in Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp to guide me and a light for my path. Verse 133 of that same chapter, it's a long chapter, by the way. Guide my steps by your word, and I will be an overcomer of any evil. God's will is found in God's word. When you're looking for God's will, look in his book that he created. He wrote it for you verse by verse. He wrote every word of it. It's his breath, the Bible says. And he teaches us. 
When you close your Bible, you close God's mouth. Let me say it again. When you close God's Bible, you close God's mouth. This is why it's important to start your day this way. It's important to end your day this way. Because what it does, when you close it, you stop. His voice doesn't speak. I've heard people all the time. They say, I'm listening for the voice. I'm looking for the miracle. I'm doing. You don't need to do those things. You need to read his word is what you need to do. God wants us to be led by him. And let me just tell you this. If God ever tells you something, now hear me, listen to me. If God ever tells you something and it is contradictive to this word, it ain't of God. So this is the thing. Someone said, well, God told me to kill somebody. That God did not tell you that. God told me to tell them off. God did not tell you that. It, it does not contradict what he says. See, a lot of people tell me they got this impression about something. I got this impression. God gave me this impression. That's how, listen to me, this is how cults start. And, the, and cults get that way because of the fact it's an impression. And I'm, I'm just saying to you, that's not of God. It, the Bible tells us, listen to me, in Galatians 1.8, it even says, even if an angel came to you and said, there are new books that have been discovered by the Bible, it says, do not pay no attention to him. Let me give you the fourth one. Five steps in guiding guidance. If I want to be guided by God, i got to do this. you got to let the Holy Spirit live in your life. And the only way the Holy Spirit can live in your life is for you to get saved. To give your life, sell out to Jesus. And the Bible says he'll fill you with your Holy Spirit and he'll guide you. He, he tells us that we, we need to understand when you're trying to make decisions. Do, what college do I go? What job do I take? Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. He's not going to mislead you. It is God himself and the Spirit form. And he's trying to make sure you understand. He wants you to move and do what he calls you to do. David writes in Psalm 27, 11, Teach me, Lord. And the only way he could get it was that. It guides us and it helps us. It helps solve the problems of our life. And he begins to show us that the Holy Spirit is, is your guidance counselor. Some of you know what that is. You've been in school and you had a guidance counselor that helped you. And their goal is to help you the best. Let, let, me, let me say this. If you get some kind of impression on your mind, I want to just, I'm going to tell you like a redneck's going to tell you. When God gives you an idea, that's called inspiration. When the devil gives you an idea, it's called temptation. And if Barry gives you an idea, it's called dumb. Just teasing. God gave you a brain, and he wants you to use it. But he wants to allow the Holy Spirit to help you. Satan cannot control you except through your thoughts. This is the biggest battlefield of everything, is your mind. Don't waste it. It's the battle. You set things. I've seen people get something in their mind, and, and, and they are just as mean as a rattlesnake. I've seen people get something in their mind, they follow the Lord, and God uses them and blesses them. I, I want to say to you, how do you get that? How do I get control of my mind and make sure everything's right? You ask God humbly. The Bible says, Psalms 25, 9, God guides the humble in what is right and teaches them this way. Remember that scripture in Proverbs, pride goes before the destruction. God is asking his people. He's asking everybody here. He's asking everybody who's watching by live stream, humble yourselves. And then he says, ask in faith. James 1 says, you're to ask in faith. You're to expect him to give you an answer. The real big reason why we don't hear God is because we don't ask him. We immediately run off. If God doesn't answer us in three minutes, we go. My friends, God didn't answer me for 18 years. I knew what he wanted. So do you. I, I don't know about you this morning, but I can tell you this, that God loves you, that he cares for you, he wants to help you, he wants you to overcome all the barriers in life. The real reason is that people are running. So, 
I know what you want to know about my ladders. I couldn't wait to do this. This is my fun part. Kind of looks dangerous, don't it? Hey, my friends tell you all the time, there's a 35-foot ladder. I go to the top and change lights all the time. I'm not scared of falling. I'm scared of the sudden stop, but I'm not scared of the fall. Here's where I am this morning. Some of you this morning in this room. This is God's side. And this is the world's side. And you're trying to live in both worlds. You want all the blessings that God has for you. All of them. You want everything. But you want one foot over here. And it won't work that way. You got to be on this side for God to bless you. If you come over here, you're going to be in the world side. And God can't bless you. Mark, I don't know about you, but it's kind of dangerous. Yes, it is kind of dangerous. It ought to be dangerous for you this morning. Yesterday, we were here. We were here late Friday night, and yesterday we had to come, and Tish was in charge of making sure every chair you're sitting in was perfectly washed and clean because we had so much dust. I, I don't like to be away from our church when we're working. I like to be right here. The phone rang. Some friends of mine, and I text them, and they had texted me first, and I said, look, I can be there at 3. And I came back and started, and the Holy Spirit said, I need you to go now. I, I came, and I told, I don't remember who I told, I got to go. Oh, it was Sandy, and maybe Flop left. I got to go. We're going to the hospital. So I, I don't break the speed limit, not unless somebody makes me mad. And I'm trying to do all the speed limit. I, there were so many people in my way getting there, but I got there. But it was a friend of mine. He grew up in church. He was growing up. He was like everybody else. He got kind of off track a little bit, but he got back on track. And he'd been fighting cancer for two years. I get there, and in 15 minutes, I can just tell this is not going, this is going in quickly. As soon as his 13-year-old daughter walked in and his son, who was 16, they walk in and spend a few minutes with him. And the little girl wouldn't move. And all of a sudden, he passed away. Here's the good thing. He was on this ladder. <laughs> so I'm just going to ask you. Melanie's going to come and play if we can get her up here. Melanie's going to play. And this morning, you need to make a decision. Every decision, I've started out the sermon this way, and I'm going to end it this way. Every decision you make in life, you're going to make a decision the day before you leave. If you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you made a decision. If you refuse him, you made a decision. It's up to you. Which side of the ladder or these ladders are you on? Where do you want to be in life? Where do you want to be God to guide you? Where do you want to be with him? God's speaking to us this morning, and he wants us to make a decision this morning to follow him. Not the world, not our friends, not the circumstances, not our culture. He wants us to follow him. Follow Jesus this morning, and your life can be changed. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just for a moment. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you this morning, and he wants you to come from where you are. And come and just find your place at this altar and begin to say, Lord, I want to be you. I want to surrender my life to you today. I want to surrender to you, Lord. Are you being led by the Holy Spirit this morning? Whosoever will come.
Would you stand and sing with us? Let's worship the Lord. afternoon. We'll see you at 4.30.